everybody. Yeah. <laughs> What's going on, guys? I'm Nathan. I'm Chris. And we're here to show you a little bit more of what we've been doing uh, with our band camp series. Uh, a bunch of stuff to facilitate easier positional work, a lot of uh, stress mitigation for taking away a little bit of the instructionals and a little bit of the how-to in it. Set you in some positions, set you into some postures, get you spending some time there and seeing how you, uh, how you deal with it. We were talking about accumulation. So with all of these things that we're kind of bringing up to the table, a lot of people are going to look at them as why is that valuable and why should I even bother doing it? And what we referenced in other videos was that we're looking for people to accumulate around 10 hours in these loaded, pressurized positions. And we're going to show you some simple tips and exercises that you're already doing. So it's like a cheap way to double dip and get your accumulation time, but also immediately reap the value of understanding what we're even talking about. So you could easily just sit in these things, do whatever you want if you're at your office chair. But if you're going to go to the gym, this is probably one of the simplest ways to just start integrating immediately. And we'll show you the reason why and how it affects everything else you're going to do regardless. Cool. Uh, so I'll situate this guy. You just want to walk me through? Yeah. So Nate's going to jump into the seated posture, occluding the lower half. And just a little background on it is the biggest problem in the industry is over cueing and I think under feeling. So most of the time, these little tools just get you into things that you will no longer have to cue. So most people are like, where's my leg drive? Where's my posture? Where's my butt? Where's other things? Slap this on and pretty much it answers it for you. And then now you don't have to worry about the lower extremities and you can just go right into the upper body stuff, which is why we're all here regardless because nobody trains legs ever. <laughs> so I'm gonna grab this peanut just to get a little comfortable, get a little bit more uh, situated in this posture. But I like to get as uh, active into the band as uh, I situate into it. So in saying I like to get active into it, I'm not slouched. I just want to feel like I'm as tall or stood up, despite me being sat down, uh, relative my skeletal structure. So in accommodating a couple of those reflexive uh, fixtures, my femurs are both distra distracted. I'm reading it in my head or what? Uh, both of my femurs are distracted and being fixed from their tether or their connective at that belt line. And so I'm able to drive forward while also separating at that sacral line. So a lot of us have back pain because we have a tendency to flare these knees, tuck the tail, and not really know what we're doing with that lower back, the end of our spine. Right now I know what I'm doing with it. And I can also fabricate some leg drive or glute drive or whatever it may be contingent on my posture or position. It also creates a lot of sensory input to the lower spine, which a lot of people don't have. Most of the time, your belt's tight in the front or your belly's big in the front, and that's where most of your pressure sensation is. And you just see like, think about it, the back of your shirt becomes untucked, and that's the only time you can actually feel your lower back is when someone's like kissing it or blowing air on it <laughs> in the office. We're not gonna demonstrate that, but we'll talk about it. <laughs> but having, having some good sensory input to the lower lumbar, it's why your weight belt works. It's not necessarily that you're able to push your abs so firmly against the leather surface. It's that now your brain actually has a little bit of a clearer map of where your lower lumbar spine is, therefore dictating more power, more safety, and more energy to it. And that's like the placebo slash neurological effect of a lot of the things we use all the time. So this is another one of those tools, but in conjunction with learning how to move in the tool, not just use the tool as a crutch. Great comparative for those of you uh, that wear leggings or high-waisted shorts same principle you're taking some of that tension or that fixture around your body and implementing it around areas where you feel you may need a little bit more sensation or a little more clerical tension or pressure so you can deliver more uh, instruction from inside out there you go so i'm hugging this peanut and I'm doing a little bit of expansive uh, position work. I'm letting my humeruses uh, extend from my body the same way that, or in a similar measure that I'm letting my femurs extend away from my body. Uh, I'm gonna 360 around if you want. Yeah. And I, I don't really have a clear picture for what I try to achieve when I try to get comfortable in this, aside from creating as much expansion around the object as possible. You'll oftentimes see people, if they're trying to do some spine rotations, they'll grab around a uniform Swiss ball and they'll do some spinal articulations. Well, 
instead of me moving around my spine to find that release, I'm gonna move my arms and I'll stretch them away from my midline. In the process of stretching my midline, I'm creating a more definite image and internal map because my reflexive features, my hands, or sorry, my arms and legs, are doing as much as they can to stretch my center mass. And when my center mass is stretched and full, there is a tremendous amount of value that comes to the brain as far as safety mechanisms and uh, mapping potential. And what you'll notice is when he takes that upper body posture, he's really just unslacking the system and pulling it to its actual tension. It's like a coat hanger. So when you're looking at that, you don't see a whole lot of tension around the upper traps and neck to lift the arms. He's literally projecting the limbs out of the sockets and creating a nice, really cool level surface so he could rotate around the midline. And then you're not bound by musculature. You're only bound by the distance and the length of the spine and the comfort in which you can control that position. So if we leave that on and I bring you a pair of dumbbells, oh, yeah. yeah, you can also show some of the value in terms of accumulation. Huh? It fights right back. Yeah. So this is an easy example of when you have this kind of bifemoral distraction. You can focus your efforts on the actual action that's taking place in the upper body, which is your intended training position. So without all that accommodation, inflection, and extension, you're basically held where you want to be held, and you're going to get this really nice reflexive action in the abdominal region to where you don't have to think. So it's basically a weight belt that includes your legs and your posture, pelvic floor, and other extremities. And you'll notice the healthier this position, the healthier this position happens naturally without cueing. So you'll normally notice people sticking their head up towards the ceiling or their head will be projected forward during their press. And I think this posture, especially because of the way he's set up, really just allows for a more natural, more neutral posture. Therefore, giving you more strength naturally. Totally true. You can uh, recruit more internally or you can create more intrinsic torque uh, or draw force from the inside when it's not moving quite so much, especially when the spine isn't leveraging to be able to create that position. My butt is pushing against the pad. I think this, like I said the last time, women may get this a little bit easier because they're more used to creating force downward. I don't know whether or not it's because family jewels or whatever get in the way of our mind's perception or the mapping, but I can Slightly tell you- lower center of gravity than women carry too, so they might just have a more intrinsic position that they normally factor into. That's why they're normally better at deadlifting and squatting genetically sometimes. And endurance exercise, so yeah. something that requires longer sustained positional competency. And from a, from a physical standpoint, anything that doesn't translate here is going to have to be made up for here and vice versa. So you'll see some people with a neck related issue that is the basis of a problematic sacrum, and you'll see some people with problematic sacrums that are problems of the postural issues in the upper cervical spine. So, this kind of fixes both because when you bank on one, you don't need to really compensate with the other. And since we're training the upper body, might as well base the opposite side. And it looks cool when you dismount. It's true. You can <laughs> actually dismount. <laughs> nice. So off the heels of that, we can take into the standing variation where we're going to still maintain two similar facets where you can have both movements, but in a fully loaded, elevated standing posture. So without the band tension, a very popular piece of equipment is a simple belt squat. So belt squats have grown in popularity predominantly because of lower lumbar injuries in power lifters. And since the lower lumbar is compressed by the upper thoracic spine when you have stuff holding onto it with your arms or you're holding onto it with your upper back, it makes sense that how are we going to get to the legs if we can't load the spine? So what started as a recovery tool can actually turn into a really big training effect. So what you should do, clip in there, and now what you're achieving, Can we scoot you in? Yeah, let's go in a little bit. So my goal with this position is I've now to 
distracted my lower lumbar and my sacrum from my upper extremities. And the way I have these ankles positioned is I still need to be active to maintain that arch that's so ever elusive in the entire training community. We're always trying to find out what's the most active foot position and there's millions of books and discussions. Today we're going to go off the idea that I care more about this because it informs my feet than I care about my feet necessarily informing my hips. So from where I am right now, I am grounded because technically all this weight is pulling me into the ground, which kind of helps me find my feet pretty quick. And if you think weighing a lot means you're going to feel grounded, you're wrong because I'm 280 and this makes me feel better with an additional 75 pounds than when I'm just standing here alone. Now, honestly, I don't want to jump towards the ceiling because that'd be harder than my own body weight. But this is a natural rest position that actually starts to fill in your real base, which I think is about right about here. So for me, this is an easy posture to manage, and I can literally go through the same exact protocol as Nate did while holding the peanut like this, and now I can add some additional tensions to it. So if you set up in these postures, you find your true grounding base, and then you extend through the midline into those wide elbow positions, and you get nice and tall, you now understand the difference between lower body going down and upper body going up. And that's kind of what we're trying to instruct people, that you have polarity going in both directions and you can use that to your advantage. It doesn't have to be subject to gravity all the time. So minding what he's saying right now in the same polarity discussion, your diaphragm is that segment. It's the separation between what you have going on in your thoracic cavity and then what you have going on in your abdominal cavity. So in the framework of breathing or posture, we're only creating a more nervously integrative position or environment wherein the information tracks quicker and facilitates more long lasting change for the body. So it may f look odd, it'll feel fantastic, so don't you mind how it looks because we're two cool looking dudes <laughs> and we do this with regularity. <laughs> it's a loaded long spine. It's yeah. what everybody's trying to coach, but they don't realize that you can add load to things and actually feel better reflexively. There's huge components of the brain and neurology that require load to drive attention. And without enough load, all the movement in the world will hit a ceiling. Yep. So when we get to the, my biggest takeaway is always, movers need to lift more and lifters need to move more, but there's a place in the middle, right about here, yeah, well, that's kind of the blend of what I'm trying to achieve and what he's trying to achieve is, what are we both missing? Do we do a million shoulder cars or do we do zero? Do we only lift a foam roll and then never move dynamically? That's like the split right down the middle. And this is kind of trying to marry those two systems. Loaded, long spine, and length through all your tissue. To the same uh, conversation, I always have this uh, question in my mind, and it's, it's where we came up with a lot of these systems for uh, when we talk about breath work and future 